Father's Day. Amen. Amen. Could we give the hand clap to the fathers? <laughs> Praise God. The Bible says, Honor your father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And that's the first commandment with promise, that your days will be long. And just like that, I don't know about you, but I found that my Heavenly Father has been a true Father to me. In times of weakness, He's been my strength. In times of sorrow, I've been able to cry on His shoulder. Praise God. I found that when I'm in need, that I've never starved, and I've never been without a place to lay my head. Praise God. He is the ultimate Father, isn't he? Praise God. Could you stand with me? And could we honor our Father by crying out, Abba, Father, because his love endureth forever, doesn't it? Jesus, we love you this morning. Hallelujah. We honor you with thanksgiving. We honor you with praise. We honor you by uplifting your name. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for being our heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord, for being our provider in the time of need. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that only that you allow us only to go through exactly as much as we can handle, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. God, we need you this morning. We invite your presence into this place, God. We welcome you into our lives. Hallelujah. God, have your way this morning, God. We want to give you glory. We want to give you honor. Hallelujah. Oh, God, you're from everlasting to everlasting. Hallelujah. You're the first and the last. Hallelujah. Praise God.
praise and thanksgiving to him today. Oh, clap your hands to the Lord this morning. We thank you, Lord. We praise you. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Good to see everyone this morning. And as Brother Jamie already mentioned, we want to wish everyone a very happy Father's Day. I'm excited to be here to worship, to praise the Lord together today. A couple of quick announcements, and then we're going to have our video announcement, and then the ushers will take the offering right after the video announcement during the first song. But a couple things. No service tonight uh, due to Father's Day. We want everyone to be able to enjoy uh, a good day of just spending time together with your family. And then next Sunday is Mission Sunday, and there's also no, it's our last Sunday of the month, and as we had uh, always done this year. There's no evening service on the last Sunday of the month, so please remember that also on the 28th. There's no evening service. Amen. So uh, one more quick announcement is that this week um, there is going to be virtual camps online at Wisconsin, Wisconsin Youth Ministries, and those are going to be on Thursday and Friday and Saturday. So if you want to check those out, I believe it's going to be Joe Campatella, Josh Carson, and Victor Jackson, some pretty awesome speakers, so you don't want to miss that, and it's on those evenings at 7, 7.30 at Wisconsin Youth Ministries on Facebook Live, so you don't want to miss those virtual camps, it's going to be a blessing, amen, amen. And uh, you can be seated just for a couple minutes as our ushers get ready, and we're going to have some uh, announcements real quick. Welcome to the Potter's House. We're glad that you came to join us in our service today. If you are a first time guest with us, we would like to invite you to fill out a connect card. When you return this back to the Welcome Center, we have a small gift of appreciation for you. Again, we believe that God is gonna do amazing things in this service. Welcome. You're here with us, blessed be your name, Jesus Christ. Have a great day celebrating with your father. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Hi, Dad. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Father's Day, big poppy. Happy Father's Day to my dad, Fred. Thank you for always being there for me. I love you. I hope you have a wonderful day. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Thank you for coming to the Sunday morning Father's Day service. Have a great day. We bless the name. service. Join us, all the musicians, all the singers, all the sound men for our music practice directly after our morning service.
Chapter 4. And I'm going to read verses, verses 1 through 10. Good to see everyone today. Amen. have it, say amen. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 1 says, Hear ye children the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. To no understanding, that's with a K. <laughs> Don't have no, N-O understanding, but have K-N-O-W understanding, right? We need to have understanding. Can you say Amen. For he says, for I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also and said unto me, let thine heart retain my words and keep my commandments and live. Get wisdom. Get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, speaking of wisdom. Evidently, wisdom is female. Shocking. <laughs> and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Exalt her, and she shall promote thee. She shall bring, bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. Verse 9, she shall give to thine head an ornament of grace, 
and a crown of glory shall she deliver to thee. Verse 10, hear, O my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of thy life shall be many. Amen. This morning I want to preach about the Father we have and the Father we need. Amen. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you, God, for this day. Lord, we celebrate fatherhood. We thank you for uh, each and every one, Lord God, that has attained this role, Lord God, in one way or another. And Jesus, we thank you for the blessings. We thank you for the provision for all that you do for us as our Heavenly Father. And we're here to give honor and glory to you today, Jesus. I pray that you unite us in faith. Lord, let our ears hear what your word would minister to us today. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So the book of Proverbs is... Mean, much much of it is written by Solomon, and he's talking about how David, his father, instructed him. Amen. So we all have a father, every one of us, in the biological sense. You wouldn't be here otherwise. That's pretty obvious, right? We all have a father. And that role was most likely filled differently for each of us. Depending on who you are, depending on who he was or is, depending upon your relationship, depending upon the culture of your family, all of that is so very different for each of us. But today I want to preach about the father that we have and the father we need. This is not a comparison. This is not about two different roles that a father can fill in our lives. There is a natural nurturing trait that an earthly father gives us. Amen? He can have that. And there's also spiritual nurturing traits that a father can give. So in some situations, these are filled by the same individual, by the same father. And in others, there is a biological father as well as a spiritual father. I'm thankful for my dad. He passed away a few years ago. I love him. And... uh, I'm thankful for all that he invested in me, all that uh, he did for me, but he was not my spiritual father. He was my biological father. He nurtured me. He taught me the things I needed to know to grow and to live, but my spiritual father is my pastor, and I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for both of these men in my life. I'm not comparing. I'm not saying that one is better than the other as far as the individual goes. But there is a natural nurturing and there is a spiritual nurturing that we need in our life. Can you say amen? So much of the book of Proverbs, as I mentioned, was written by King Solomon, referring to that instruction given to him by his father, King David. In fact, if you have read the Old Testament, if you've gone through any type of Bible study, if you've read the Scriptures, you will find that throughout the history of Israel, throughout the prophets, throughout even the books of poetry, there are many references about fathers, about their instruction, or about their blessings to their children. You'll find that Job, one of the earliest books of the Bible, uh, Job prayed and offered sacrifices for his children just in case they sinned against God. He wanted to bless his family. You will find that uh, Abraham was a blessing to his son Isaac, even though he had to take him to top of Mount Moriah and offer him as a sacrifice to God. You'll find uh, stories about Isaac and about Jacob, about Moses, and about uh, the different prophets and the different priests and individuals. All of these having children, all of these references on how they instructed or failed to instruct. Throughout Israel's history of kings, you'll find that there were kings and then their children came into succession after them, right? Like Saul wanting his son Jonathan to be the next king, but God's choice was David. And so Saul had a problem with that. You'll find uh, throughout the history of, of the kings of Israel and Judah, you'll have a king, and whether he was evil or whether he was good, he had a son, and sometimes that son followed in good step good footsteps and sometimes they followed in bad footsteps but you'll find those examples all throughout the old testament of these instruction or the blessing or the influence that these men had on their sons or even their daughters 
So throughout that history of the children of Israel, the Bible talks emphatically about fathers and their children. Genealogy was very important to their culture. What I find very interesting and that I never realized before preparing for this message is that as full as the Old Testament is with relationships as naturally between fathers and children, in the New Testament, it is practically obsolete. Did you ever realize that before? You hear about the sons of David and the sons of Moses and the sons of Aaron and the sons of Samuel and, and the sons of uh, all these different prophets and in, individuals in the Old Testament. Have you ever read once about the son of John or the son of James or Matthias or Peter? You don't. You don't read about it at all. In fact, uh, the only really, there's, there's very little, there is some, uh, a, a, aside from the fact of covering the genealogy of Jesus and talking about his brothers and sisters, the only person I find in the New Testament whose children are mentioned is Philip, the evangelist. It tells us in Acts 21 and 8, the next day that we uh, that were of Paul's company departed this is through Paul's missionary journeys and on his way to Rome. And they came to Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven. He was with Stephen, who was martyred. And he abode with him. And verse 9 says, The same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. Out of all the apostles, all the disciples, all the followers of Jesus that are mentioned in the Bible, only Philip is mentioned of his children. Isn't that interesting? I'm not aware of any other. Children in general are mentioned, but no children of the disciples. We know that Peter was married. He had a mother-in-law. So in the Old Testament, you will find story after story of individuals and leaders, good and bad, whose children and even grandchildren are mentioned. Time after time, Story after story, descendant after descendant, the Old Testament mentions them. And when we get to the New Testament, that is not the case. That is not the focus. Now, I know for each of us this is going to be a little bit different, but I've used examples that are close to my heart and close to things that I like and come natural to me. So in the natural sense of a father teaching your children, there's some ki things our kids need to learn. They need to learn how to tie a knot or how to tie their shoe. I helped my kids, as my wife did, learn how to tie their shoes. How to read. We read to them when we were little. I can remember when Ethan was little, he had a book called The Giving Tree. Anybody remember that book? And I remember uh, one day I had my assistant pastor, Mike Adams, come over. I said, hey, Brother Adams, you got to check this out. Ethan was probably three. I said, Ethan can read this entire book. And he's like, three? He can read everything in this book? I'm like, yeah, he can. I was like, Ethan, read this book. And he's like, there was a tree. And he starts going through this whole book. And then pretty soon he starts reading, pa he's flipping pages before he gets them done read. He couldn't read, but he had the whole book memorized. And he went through it, and, and Brother Adams was amazed. Like, I can't believe a three-year-old just read this whole book. I'm like, he really... He, he didn't read the whole book. He's got it memorized. Because we read it to him. It was his favorite book. We read it every day. And so you read to your children. You fish with them. Uh, I'm sure Parker knows how to put his own bait on, right? Knows how to take the hook out of his fish? Yeah? Does he learn how to clean them yet? That's next. Because then you don't have to do it anymore. Right? You teach them how to do that. You play catch with them. Teach them to throw a ball, how to pound a nail and build a tree house. I can remember hearing stories of Jamie building a tree house in Verona. And, uh all the escapades that went along with that. But you do those things. You teach them how to respect a firearm, how to shoot it, how to clean it, how to do chores and work, how to have an adult conversation and respect their elders, how to change a tire or change the oil in the vehicle. Alexis, has your dad taught you how to change a tire yet? It's coming. It's coming. Because the last thing you want is to get somewhere and not know how to change a tire if you got a flat tire. So there are things that naturally, as fathers, we teach our children. And then there's spiritual things they need. As a spiritual father, 
We have to teach them to pray. How to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, first and foremost. Teach them to pray. Let them hear you pray. Pray by example. Encourage them to pray. Keep them, accountability, keep them accountable to praying and praying for others. How to worship God, how to praise God, how to give to God. How to volunteer for things and support the work and the effort of the ministry, right? How to read and study their Bible, how to love God and how to love others, how to forgive. We need to teach our children how to forgive by example. Amen. How to have patience. <laughs> but they're the ones that caused me to lose my patience. <laughs> and they learn from that. So we have to teach them patience, right? I mean, nobody else ever loses their patience with their kids. <laughs> humility. We teach them humility. Kindness and mercy. Those are spiritual things that, as spiritual fathers... We need to teach. So there are natural things that that happen. And we, you know, I know for for me, my dad really wasn't a come here, son, sit on my lap. I'm going to teach you something. I'm going to show you something. It was more like if you want to learn this, you better keep up. <laughs> and so I had to learn and the things that I wanted to learn, I had to keep up. So I know that there are some things I learned from my dad. I learned the value of hard work and, and my kids hate it because we can be doing a job and it can it can be too hot it can be too cold it can be starting to rain it can be lunchtime and they're like dad <laughs> are we done i'm like almost it was always it's always almost isn't it just one more thing right because it, that's how i was raised you're on a farm you, you got to get it done you, daylight's burning and so those are some things that i learned from my dad but from my spiritual dad i learned to pray i learned the value of my relationship with god i learned to minister and all of those things so there are very important things church that yes naturally we need to learn but also spiritually we need in our life can you say amen so there's fathers that we have and there's fathers that we need sometimes they're the same man other times they're different men and i realize that there are unfortunate situations where neither is present so you have to search it out I didn't always have a spiritual father in my life, but once I learned the value of that, I had to search him out. I had to find him. I had to say, this is the one I want to minister to me. I had to submit myself to him, to surrender to him and say, you know what? I want you to have this role in my life. It was up to me to find that. Can you say amen? I want you to pray for a friend of mine's family. He's got his children are older, but on Friday, a, a friend of mine, a classmate, passed away from cancer, leaving a wife and, and three kids. And now they have, to, they have to retain and remember everything that he's invested in their life so far because he's gone. I can remember when my dad passed away. It doesn't matter how old you are when that happens. I can remember the next time, shortly after that he died, I had a situation, I had a problem. I was like, oh, I'll call. No, I won't. I can't. But I could remember. I could just think, you know, if it was something that he would do, how would he do it or how would he not do it? And so I really believe with all my heart is that the reason that the New Testament is so much different than the Old Testament concerning this is because the focus is much more on that spiritual role. Can you say amen? In the Old Testament, the children, mainly sons, but sometimes daughters, they naturally inherited into the kingdom of their father or into their inheritance. It just happened automatically. The oldest would sometimes get the best or however God decided in their family if there was something special going on. But it was just a natural. It was a given. They wanted children. Their children were mentioned and everything they had went on to their children. They were blessed simply because of who their parents were. Amen. 
In the New Testament, we realize that as individuals, we each need our own relationship with our Heavenly Father if we're going to enter into the kingdom of God. My children are not simply going to be blessed and have a guaranteed spot just because I'm a pastor. And your children, just because you attend a church, it's not going to happen. When that little baby girl is born, brother and sister Morgan, you have got to invest in her the priorities of the kingdom of God because she needs that for herself just as if each of us do. I remember hearing time and time again from my father-in-law. I, he taught his children, this isn't something you're going to get in on mom and dad's coattails. Those are the words, right? Taught them all the time. It's not just a privilege thing that's going to happen automatically because mom and dad pray. No, you need it for yourself. You need that individual in your life that's going to mentor you, that's going to encourage you and teach you to be the individual that Jesus Christ has designed you to be. We do not receive those spiritual blessings simply because mom and dad have a relationship with God. Though there are not natural fathers really mentioned in the new testament you don't read about peter taking his kids out or doing anything with his kids or john or james or any of them you do read about spiritual fathers the book of luke chapter 1 verse 3 luke starts out his letter saying and he also started out the book of acts to the same individual it seemed good to me also about the gospel and writing the gospel, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Luke was writing to Theophilus, who he also addresses in the book of Acts, an individual that he must have been mentoring, that he must have been ministering to, possibly a spiritual father to. First Timothy 1 and 2, Paul writes, Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith. And Titus 1 and 4, again, Paul writes, To Titus, my own son after the common faith. See, there are not mentioned any physical fathers and their children other than Philip, but there are mentioned spiritual ones. Even Jesus was a spiritual father to many. In Luke 18 and 18, it says, A certain ruler asked Jesus, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, Why call me good? There is none good save one, that is God. You know the commandments. Don't commit adultery. Don't kill. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Honor thy father and mother. He said, All these I've kept from my youth up. And Jesus, when he had heard that, he said, Yet thou lackest one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute unto the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. It was an invitation to become a spiritual son. Here was an individual that was possibly looking for a mentor in his life but when he heard this he was very sorrowful for he was very rich now the bible or not necessarily the bible that at least that i've read but people refer to this as the rich young ruler i don't know how young he was i don't know his age it it doesn't say that he was a young man necessarily but i think just looking at the situation We understand that here's an individual, whereas maybe somebody older than Jesus wouldn't have came to him in this manner. But this man who is possibly young comes, who is a ruler. He's got some authority. You want to talk about a bad combination. Youth, money, and authority. (laughs) That's recipe for a disaster right there. If you don't have some mentoring, if you don't have some instruction, if you don't have some guidance... You add those three things together, man, you got a mess. And he evidently was a mess. And Jesus' response was, it's not about what you do, it's about who you become. Jesus invested spiritually into this individual. He made himself available. He said, come and follow me, but he made the choice not to. See, it's still our choice on whether or not we're going to follow, whether or not we're going to be mentored, whether or not we're going to be invested in. Jesus also invested into his disciples. This is really interesting. I had never seen this correlation 
in the Bible before about Peter, but listen to this. In John 21 and 17, of course, Jesus said to Peter the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, lovest thou me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And he says, feed my sheep. What Jesus was saying, if you love me, if you are truly coming after me, if I have invested in you and you have followed me, you need to continue doing what I'm doing. If you've read about the disciples of Jesus, you will quickly realize that Peter was a main focus in Jesus' ministry. I mean, uh, and what's incredible to, incredible to me is the spiritual growth you can see through Peter in the New Testament. I mean, think of his escapades. He was the one who got out of the boat. Lord, if it's you, bid me to come walking on the water. Jesus, I will never, I will die for you. Jesus who? Right? I mean, his profession, his denial, walking on water, all of the things that he was a part of, all the things that he did. And now Jesus, in John 21, near his death, he's saying, you need to continue to disciple my people. You need to love them. You need to care for them. Feed my sheep. That's talking about a relationship that a shepherd has with his followers. That's very intimate when he says, feed my sheep. It's not taking care of a bunch of done animals. It's not just throwing a few things out there, here and there. No, it's intentionally leading them to green pastures, leading them to still waters. It's ministering to them. This is very intimate. This is very close. This is very personal. In fact, he later told Peter, he says, when you're converted, strengthen your brethren. So he's encouraging Peter, you're not there yet, son. You need to grow. You've got a little bit ways to go. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep learning. Keep drawing near to me. Keep allowing me to invest and minister into your life. So look what happens. Of course, we know when Jesus was alive, all of the struggles Peter had and all the accomplishments he had. But look how his faith continues to grow after Jesus' death. Acts chapter 11. If you remember Acts chapter 10, Peter was at... A, a place and he was up on the roof he had been fasting he has a vision god sends a, a sheet to be lowered down all kinds of unclean and clean animals rise peter kill and eat not so lord i've never eaten anything unclean and god says don't call common what i have clean the lord jesus is trying to teach peter hey i'm gonna lead you to a people that you normally thought before were unclean but i want to save them and so at the same time, Cornelius is being ministered to. An angel says, go send for Peter because God wants the Gentiles to receive salvation. You have to understand in Jewish culture, they were not to do that. Jews were not to go in to unclean people and eat with them. It was against the law. He could be condemned. He could be stoned. He could have the law of Moses come against him. And so God tells Peter this three times. He says, there's men coming. Go with them doubting nothing. So Peter goes goes to Cornelius's house while he's speaking to them the Holy Ghost falls upon them they speak in other tongues they glorify God Peter says to the others with him can anyone forbid water there's others other Jews with Peter he thankfully had some witnesses and, and so they baptize them in the name of Jesus Christ but just a couple verses later in Acts 11 and 2 all of this news spreads back home to Jerusalem to where the converted Christian Jews are and it says when Peter was come to Jerusalem they were that of the circumcision Jews contended with him you went in and ate with people that were unclean he had to rehearse the whole thing he had to defend himself he had to pull up the witness and say these men were with me I mean, who was I that I could withstand God? I was just doing what I thought I should do, and they were contending with him. You have to understand the position Peter is in here. You went into men uncircumcised and ate with them. What does the law say about that, Peter? And he had to defend himself. He had to show that. So after he does, he brings in the fact there were other witnesses. Obviously, this is very uncomfortable for Peter. So then we know that Stephen had been martyred, right, back in Acts chapter 6? And where did what happened then to the Jews after Stephen was martyred? They said, we're getting out of here. 
Saul is insane. He's killing people. They went as far as Antioch, the Bible says, and they began ministering to people. And so they began ministering to other individuals and spreading the word, and more and more people were receiving the Holy Ghost and being baptized in Jesus' name. And so it says in Acts 11 and 27, after Paul and Barnabas were in Antioch, where the, where the disciples were first called Christians, they were starting to minister to them, and they sent for Paul and Barnabas, and they're having a great time, and then the news spreads where? Back home to Jerusalem again. So Acts 11 and 27 says, And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem to Antioch. Who do you think the prophets were? It was the elders, it was James, it was Peter, it was all these elders came to Antioch. So there was a revival in Antioch due to the persecution of Stephen. Leaders from Jerusalem came to encourage them. However, something happened during this situation we don't find in the book of Acts, but we do find in the book of Galatians. Chapter 2, verse 11, Paul says, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that, before uh, Peter came, before that certain came from James, he says, before that these others came, Peter did eat with the Gentiles. So Peter must have been one of the earlier ones at Antioch with Paul. He was sitting down saying, isn't this great? We're eating with the Gentiles. They received the Holy Ghost. They received the, 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 the gospel of Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, James and the elders come. So what does Peter do? He withdraws, separates himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Well, no wonder. What happened the last time he did that? They contended with him. He had to prove himself. And then it says, And other Jews disassembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas was also carried away with their dissimulation. So what happened was Peter came to Antioch to celebrate with the Gentiles who received the gospel. When the other leaders came, those same leaders who questioned him eating with the Gentiles earlier with Cornelius, he feared them and he didn't want the confrontation again, so he withdrew. And it caused problems. And so Paul said, I had to correct it. So how did Peter grow from these situations? In Acts 15 and 1, Again, they're still dealing with the same situation, the same individuals, the same contention. If Gentiles are coming into the gospel and going to be proselytes, they have to be circumcised. They have to follow the law of Moses. They have to do all these things, right? And so Acts 15 and 1, certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except you're circumcised after the manner of Moses, you can't be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about the question. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenix and, and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. They caused great joy unto, unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done to them. But there rose up a certain sect of the Pharisees, which believed in Jesus, saying that it was needful to circumcise these Gentiles and command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. And when there had been much disputing, guess who finally stands up? Guess who finally says, enough is enough. What would Jesus do? I backed off, and I, I was scared with Cornelius, and I, had to, I, I threw my brothers under the bus. Ask them, they were here. And then later with Paul in Antioch, and I messed up there, it's not happened again. Peter stands up and says, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made a choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And later on, just down a couple verses, after that they held their peace, and James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simon had declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name, and to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. 
Look at that spiritual growth. Peter starts out, I don't want that contention. And I don't want that problem. I don't want to be, I don't want to be the one looked at negatively. Who wants that? Right? Who wants to be the new guy to do the new thing that nobody else has done before? And is this acceptable? Is this okay? But he was becoming more and more like his spiritual father. What did Jesus first tell Peter in the very beginning when he called him? Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Let's stand together. So there is a father that we are. I'm sure that Peter's father taught him and Andrew how to fish, how to throw nets, how to fix a boat, how to find the fish, how to do all the things to make their living. But Jesus came along and said, I'm going to be a spiritual father to you. I'm going to teach you different things. And so for each of us, I realize that there are things that we teach our kids naturally as fathers. I can remember when Ethan was about 18 months old. We lived in Oniko. I was roofing my little one-and-a-half car shed. And then before, I was like, I had fixed some siding, and he was walking around with a hammer and nails, 18 months old, trying to pound them into the siding, so I had to go through and pull all these half-pounded nails out, right, because I couldn't get them all the way in. And I'm up on the roof. I, she's busy doing something, not watching our child. And all of a sudden, as I'm up on the roof of this garage, it wasn't very high, but again, 18 months I hear him talking behind me. Climbs up the ladder that I had behind the garage, up on the roof, hammer in his hand. What do you need me to do? So there's things that we teach, right? And there's things that come naturally, but there's some things that are needful. So I know who we are, but there's also somebody we have to strive to become. And it might not just be for our own children. It might be for somebody else's kids. It might just be that we need to mentor somebody, to invest in somebody, to bless somebody. Because natural is natural. It happens. But spiritual is needful. People need to be born again. People need to experience the power of the Holy Ghost in their life. People need to be baptized in Jesus' name to have their sins washed away. They need to learn how to worship and how to pray and, and how to minister and how to give and how to bless the Lord. They need to learn those things. They need to be taught Bible studies. They need to be mentored spiritually. We need to be led closer to our Heavenly Father. In 2 Kings 13, I think it is, Elisha is lying on his deathbed. He's about ready to pass. And Joash the king comes up and says, My father, my father, the chariots of God, the horsemen thereof. And Elisha says, One last lesson, Joash. Get some arrows. Fire him out the window. And when you do that, that the Lord is going to speak and declare how many times you're going to defeat your enemies. So Joash grabbed the arrows, struck three times. And the last lesson he said, you should have done it five or six. He should have gone a little bit farther. Church, we need spiritual leaders, spiritual mentors, spiritual fathers in our life. As necessary as learning how to change a tire is, those spiritual things are so much more necessary because eternity is forever. Amen. AAA is available, but eternity is forever. And our kids and those that God has placed in our care, they need to know how to have a relationship with their Heavenly Father. I just want to open up this time right now if we could just find a place to pray. As God is ministering to you, as his word is encouraging us this morning, why don't we find a place to pray and ask the Lord to help us? Maybe we need to give some thanksgiving for the people that God has placed in our lives.
whatever it might be, but I encourage you, let's find a place right now to draw near to God, to speak to Him and say, Lord God, would you help me? Would you help me to become the individual that you've called me to be? In Jesus' name.
lift up our hands to our Heavenly Father today. God, we thank you. We love you, Jesus, for all that you do for us. God, for the individuals, Lord God, that you've placed in our lives. God, to minister to us, to spiritually lead us and guide us and help us. And Lord, I pray that you would help us all to realize, every single one of us, the opportunities we have on a regular basis, God, to be spiritual influencers, mentors, leaders, in other people's lives, God, and the importance of that. Whether they're our own children or family members or whether it's somebody that we just met, God, help us to be ministers of your gospel, ministers of your word, children, God, of your light. We thank you. We love you. Bless each and every one today. God, bless our days, Lord God, whatever they may be full of. But God, help us to keep you first in everything that we do. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. No service tonight. Lord willing, we will see you on Wednesday. God bless you.